Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRO and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Advancing Research Capabilities at Academic Libraries, which is sponsored by Springer Nature. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you will see a Q&A panel. If you don't, please click the button labeled Q&A in the upper right-hand corner of the screen to activate the panel. The Q&A panel will allow you to submit questions for, to our speakers and to ask for assistance. At the end of the presentation, Maureen and Paul will take a few minutes to respond to your questions, so please do send them in throughout. If you experience any technical issues, please use the Q&A panel to let me know and I'll troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Today, we're using the hashtag ACRL Choice Webinars during the event, so if you have another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Also note that we are recording today's program, and everyone who registered will receive a follow-up email with a link to the archived version. And here to introduce our presenters today is Michael DeSanto from Springer Nature. Michael, Thanks. over to you. Thanks, Mark, and again, welcome, everyone. We're excited to have Paul Risen, Product Manager for Recommended at Springer Nature, here with us today to discuss some of the challenges researchers face in keeping up to date with developments in their subject areas. He will provide an overview of Recommended, a cutting-edge new service that helps connect your students, faculty, and researchers with the most relevant content based on their specific needs. Paul joined Springer Nature in September 2016 after almost 10 years working across a number of online offerings at the BBC. A former history graduate, Paul has been an information architect along with product managing the BBC's research and education space partnership. Presenting with Paul today is Maureen Knapp. Maureen will talk about Shared It, a new content sharing initiative from Springer Nature that allows your students, faculty, and researchers to easily and legally share links to free-to-read versions of research articles. She will outline the benefits of this added value service in facilitating discussions and collaborations at academic libraries and demonstrate how you can make the most of shared it at your library. Maureen leads Springer Nature's author and partner marketing and services team, where she brings industry-leading researcher services like Shared It, Book Metrics, and Springer Nature Storytellers to authors and broader audiences. In addition, she is a seasoned pro bono consultant, helping nonprofits with board development, financial audits, program evaluations, and marketing. At this point, we're ready to get started. Over to you, Paul. So we're going to cover, uh, firstly, of course, what actually is recommended, um, why have Springer Nature decided to develop this service, um, then we'll talk a little bit about how it works, um, how we go about developing new features, so this is a product that is continuously evolving as well, um, and finally, I'll just give you uh, a couple of links to how you can try the service for yourself. So first of all, what is recommended? Well, let's put it in context a little bit. Um, so Springer Nature's mission overall is to help researchers, students, teachers, and professionals to discover, learn, and achieve more. Um, and when we take that to recommended as a product, we see that the vision for recommended is that we will keep scientists and researchers up to date in their field by making pan-publisher content recommendations based on users' reading behavior with minimal effort from users. So there's a few important points here in the vision. Um, we want to keep people up to date in their field by giving them kind of the latest uh, or most certainly the most relevant content for them. Um, 
it's important to note that we make PAN publisher recommendations. So we don't just recommend content from Springer Nature. We'll recommend um, content from across uh, the corpus. We base this on users' reading behavior. So rather than a lot of other recommendation systems which are more content focused, so they will recommend based on the content that you're looking at at any particular time, this is based on your past activity, so your reading behavior across the Springer Nature websites. Um, and importantly for us, we want to do this with minimal effort from users. So frequently when this kind of thing has been tried in the past, uh, there's been a lot, lot of effort that users have to put in to get decent recommendations out. Where possible, we want to bring this service to our users where they are at the time that they most need it um, without them having to fill in lots of forms, tick lots of boxes, that kind of thing. Where possible, we want to make this as easy as possible to use. Um, all of this boils down really to it's a personalized primary paper recommendation service. So why recommended? So uh, about a year or so ago, Springer Nature did some user research. Um, they ran surveys and did kind of targeted research with a wide variety of potential uh, audiences. Um, so we surveyed principal investigators in the lab, postdocs, and PhD students. Um, really trying to look for where were the pain points, so what problems are users having um, across their day-to-day -day work. The main ones that came out of the study were the lack of time and lack of trust, so lack of time to keep on top of all the literature that's get, getting published every day, um, and the lack of trust, not knowing kind of the quality uh, of the papers, so how do you know which ones to read, which ones not to bother with. Um, anecdotally, we were told that a lot of principal investigators act as a kind of guide for people in the lab, saying, okay, well, you know, here's the latest issue of Nature, uh, read these articles, don't bother with these ones, or, oh, I see you're reading that article, maybe you shouldn't bother because this scientist you know, hasn't got a very good reputation or things like that. Um, so we ran a follow-up survey more recently, I think this September, October uh, of 2016, um, really just sanity checking this user need. So yeah, as you can see on the slide, 73% of our users who responded strongly agreed that they would really benefit from a more efficient way of staying up to date with research papers. Um, and, as I emphasized before, they would also appreciate a service that, recommend that recommends papers outside of just nature. Um, although, obviously, we, you know, we want to promote the Spring of Nature journals and things like that, we do recognize that in order to be a useful service for people, um, it would be much more useful if we could recommend from across the corpus. Uh, and we use Crossref as our basis for recommending things. Um, so again, this kind of gets to the heart of what the user need is. Here are the kind of the fears and worries that people have when we did this research. So I only have time to read five papers. Which ones should I read? Just give me those, you know, straight to the point, read these ones. Um, there's a little element of kind of Ego, I suppose, in the lab. You know, how do I establish my reputation for being in the know? Um, part of that is also how do I know what things to be aware of in terms of future funding? Uh, and then finally, um, how do I reduce wasted research time due to being scooped? Um, so, you know, you don't want to spend years researching something only to find the last minute that somebody else has already done this research or published ahead of you. So how can we reduce that time between you starting your research and being scooped? We want to let you know as soon as possible. Um, so what shouldn't recommend it be? Um, so we don't, we're not aiming to be a search engine like Google Scholar or PubMed or even kind of what you can get straight from Crossref. 
Um, we're well aware of that Google Scholar does kind of do recommendations of a sort, and of course other services as well. Um, we don't want to be a social network site, so this isn't about connecting to other scientists, researchers, um, sharing things like that. Um, and it isn't a reference manager. So whereas we will give you a list of recommendations and we may look into things like reading history and stuff like that in the future, this isn't uh, a standalone application uh, for managing your references. We want to be useful as much as possible, but really the core thing here is around recommendations. So who are our users? Um, again, from the survey, most of the users are early to mid-career researchers, so rather than people who are very experienced in what they uh, what their research is, so the, the hypothesis there is that they already know what they're looking for, they can make good judgments over what they would recommend. Um, we've noticed that most of our users work in academia rather than industry, um, and researchers are spread across the globe. So I'm speaking to you from London, UK, 42% uh, of our users um, are based in North America, 28% in Europe, 22% in Asia and 8% elsewhere. So how does it work? Um, this is probably useful for you if you're going to um, talk about the service to your, uh, your patrons, your users. Um, a little, little bit more technical detail, not too much hopefully. Um, so we use an algorithm. Um, algorithm is a bit of a buzzword at the moment, but I'll uh, try and go through exactly what happens. So we start with a reader. The reader will read an article uh, or they'll notice our pop-up and click a recommendation to read an article. Uh, we are notified of that happening. Uh, we're using a cookie which we place, uh, which is on the website whenever you visit um, nature.com, um, Springer Link, Biomed Central or Springer Open. There is a cookie there. Um, it is anonymized, so we have a generic user ID um, which is relevant for your session. As soon as you clear your cookies, that will have gone. Um, and then we just record the DOI of the article that you're reading. So the DOI gets sent to recommended. Um, we look in our network of related papers um, for suitable recommendations. So in this network, we are mainly uh, using Crossref as our corpus. We are also using PubMed. Um, and we also use some information from Altmetric, uh, so the Altmetric score, anything to help us uh, and the algorithm decide which might be the most relevant, uh, useful papers for users. So then we take um, up to five recommendations um, and give them back to the reader. So reader reads the paper. We will find that paper in our network of related papers find ones which are similar or connected somehow uh, using various kind of measures of connectedness uh, and then send those back, recommendations. And of course, if a reader then clicks on one of those recommendations, that's a signal to us that it's been a useful recommendation. So we'll uh, add it, you know, um, improve its score so that next time somebody reads a similar article, it's more likely to be recommended. How we deliver recommendations. So our main avenue of delivering recommendations at the moment is through a pop-up. Um, so this is on uh, nature.com across all the journals, across all the Biomed Central journals and Springer Open. Um, it's not a separate pop-up window, it's within the uh, main window at the bottom right-hand corner. Um, we have a mantra in the team, we don't want to be annoying as much as possible. Um, so here, the pop-up will only uh, appear once you started scrolling the page, um, and we're doing some work now to try and make it so it'll only appear once you scroll past the abstract. Um, that seems to be the point at which users know whether they're going to read more or whether actually this paper isn't very useful for them. Um, we give a maximum of five recommendations. 
um, at any one point. And then at the end of the pop-up, um, there is an invitation to sign up for uh, weekly emails where you can get more recommendations. So I can hopefully do a live demo. I go on to NCOMS. So you see here, I'm on the Nature Communications homepage. I will click on an article, which will then load. And as I start scrolling, ah, so you should see in the bottom right hand corner, a little notification has come up there. So this is the minimized state. Um, users, when they're first coming to see this, they will see the pop-up immediately. Um, if it's annoying to them, they can close the pop-up. Um, we will endeavor to remember that they've closed the pop-up, so next time they visit, it will start minimized, as it has done for me. So they can open it. Um, you can click through to the recommendations. Um, let's say maximum of five. I've only got one here. Um, and then you can sign up for the email service as well, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, yeah, that's back to that. So I'll go back to my presentation slides. There we go. So how else do we deliver recommendations? Um, we also, as I mentioned, uh, emails. So you have to opt into it. We won't send you anything if you don't want it. Um, you will get an email every week with up to 10 recommendations, um, both on the pop-up and in the email. These are ordered by number one is obviously the most likely to be relevant to you, and then sliding scale going down. Um, we'll only send these to you if we have new recommendations to show. So if you have clicked on a recommendation, we won't show it to you again. Um, whereas if, you, if we've shown you a recommendation but you haven't done it, um, we may show it to you again. Um, users can change the frequency uh, of the emails that they're sending. Um, so we offer the ability for you to get this um, every two weeks, every three weeks, every four weeks. Um, and you can also change the day that you receive the emails. So by default, uh, the email is sent um, every week on the day that you signed up, but perhaps you prefer to have it every Monday or every Friday. You can change your preferences at the bottom of the email. You can also unsubscribe, of course. There's just a little close up of the email. I'm just gonna check that I'm still presenting okay. Everything seems to be okay, as I can see. Yep, okay. So that's the email. Um, and then recently, we've just launched on Springerlink, so across all the Springerlink journals. Here, we haven't gone for a pop-up. Um, we, we show the recommendations at the bottom of an article. Um, so after the copyright information, below the references, um, it's important to us that we don't seem that we're part of the, the main content, that we're part of the article. It's tried to be clearly defined separate from that. Um, here we only show up to three recommendations um, and we don't show the uh, email sign up. Although if you click on the Powered by Recommended logo in the bottom right hand corner, you'll come to our um, homepage where you can sign up for the emails. Um, and of course, again, we will only show this, this box if we have recommendations to show. Same with the pop-up. We will only ever appear if we feel we have good enough recommendations to show you. How do we develop new features? So as I mentioned at the beginning, this is still an evolving service. Um, we're not done yet. We still want to continue to be useful for people. So we use data. Um, so everything we develop we will A-B test. So we give half the audience the existing version of the product and half the audience the new version of the product. Um, and we test and we you know, put it out there for maybe a week um, and see, do people like the new version? Are they clicking more? Are they clicking on more recommendations that way or not? Um, if it doesn't work, that's fine. We won't roll out that to all the users. 
We call ourselves data informed, not data driven. So we don't just look at the raw numbers, we'll take into account, does this make sense to a user? Even if the raw numbers show that more people click uh, on this thing, this may not be the right move for users. You know, we don't just want them to be clicking endlessly, it needs to be the right recommendations. Um, as far as possible, we do everything as experiments. Um, we've learned that most of the, we really should do experiments when us as a team, we're really confident about something or we don't know at all. Um, so that's the best time to really get out there and test with real users. Um, the experiments, of course, will tell us what, they'll tell us whether people are clicking, but they won't necessarily tell us why people are clicking or not clicking. Um, so we follow up those experiments with research. Um, some example experiments. So originally when we launched this in beta, um, we were nature branded, um, but we knew that we wanted to launch across Springer Link, Biomed Central, Springer Open. Um, and it was confusing to users. They thought that the recommendations we were providing would only be from nature because we had the nature branding. So we tested lots of different um, branding ideas and we settled on our recommended brand. This has meant that some people trust it less because it doesn't have the explicit kind of nature seal of approval, but it's the same recommendation, same quality, same everything. So this is more just the case of people getting used to it. Um, when we first launched uh, about a year ago, um, we had a previous button so people could get back to recommendations they may have clicked past. We got rid of that because we felt that it meant that people weren't clicking recommendations so much. Um, but then we put it back in because even though it may slightly decrease the number of uh, recommendations people click on, uh, it's a useful utility. It's something that users want, they need, they've told us they want it, so we've put it back in. Um, there's a couple of other things. So we were really sure that um, including the first figure of an article would mean more people clicked on it. Um, that wasn't the case at all. So we also um, are very lucky to have across the road from our offices in London, um, the Crick Institute, Francis Crick Institute. Um, and so every month or so we try and meet with them. We're meeting with them on Thursday. Um, just to talk with them, find out more about you know, their research, their day-to-day -day practices, their work, test out some ideas of you know, things we want to do, new features, is the service not working for them, that kind of thing. Um, it's very important as much as we want to test at scale by putting things live, uh, we need to you know, find out as much as we can about how real researchers work as well. So finally, how can you try the service? Um, so obviously it will appear uh, as a pop-up across all those next journals. So if we, um, if we know enough of your reading history and we feel we've got good enough recommendations we can give to you, you'll see the pop-up or you'll see on Springer Link the box. Um, otherwise, you can go to uh, recommended.springernature.com. Um, you can read a bit more about the service. Um, you can get an example of some recommendations that you might receive. Um, and you can sign up directly for the emails there as well. Um, finally, if you have any questions at all about the service, uh, things not working how you expect, um, any technical problems people are having, please do feel free to uh, email us, recommended at springandnature.com. We will try to get through uh, as many uh, questions that we have. Um, and we, we're a small team, um, but like I say, we don't want to be annoying. We want to provide the most useful thing. Um, so we're constantly developing the service um, and want to make it better. So it may take a while for us to develop things, but we are, we're on the side, we're on your side. So we want to make the best we can be. Uh, Paul, thank you for that. And first, thanks for framing our mission uh, for the participants. It's interesting and I think valuable to put our technical developments in that overarching framework and it's certainly at the core of all we do. So thanks for reminding all of us on the call that uh, we are mission driven as well. Um, 
And moving from the content discovery to the content uh, sharing aspect, and to further explore the pioneering free researcher tools offered by Springer Nature, I'm going to take about 10 minutes or so to introduce you to Shared It. Um, I see a lot of questions did come in uh, for Paul, so I want to make sure there's time to answer those at the end. So we can just have a look just very quickly. For those of you not yet familiar or still unclear based on the quick descriptions we've been dropping through the, um, the webinar introductions, Springer Nature Shared It is, uh, as mentioned, our free content sharing initiative that provides a simple way to share research with the academic community and beyond. Uh, you'll see in the description there, there's a notation, uh, uh, share content easily and legally. And those are two words that um, I do present from the marketing standpoint, we spent a lot of time kind of delving into uh, the exact words we'd use, and it kind of just boiled down to that. It had to be easy, and it had to be legal. Um, it's already been rolled out to all of the Springer Nature-owned portfolio of journals, uh, as well as over a 1,000 uh, co-owned or partner-owned journals uh, with academic societies. We've also extended it to over 200 media organizations, and I'm going to dig into what that actually means um, going forward. But again, I'm going to come in from a marketing perspective. Paul presented very much from a product development view, which I think is so interesting uh, and certainly different from the way I approach it. I'm going to come more with a story. And I think it breaks down pretty nicely into three chapters. So it started back in 2014 with a trial uh, from Nature, from the Nature-branded um, publications. Last year, we rolled out uh, large scale, and as you saw, uh, fully launched in October. Um, and now, one quarter into 2017, we already have some early findings um, that we can kind of look at and see early indicators on where we need to go moving forward. So let's look a little bit at each chapter of the story. Between 2000 and 2000, uh, 2014 and 15, the trial occurred for very basic reasons. We wanted to help researchers collaborate. This is to keep up with the sharing that was already expanding rapidly um, with the web and, and with um, social sharing networks among scientists. We wanted to provide the public with a way to read scientific content, which is also becoming more prevalent with the web. And we wanted to be complementary to and not in any way compete or confuse with our open access initiatives, which um, Springer Nature has quite a few open access offerings, whether it's open access journals, books, or data. In addition, there was an opportunity for the pilot or trial to really influence and inform the industry. So we really felt a role uh, there, and we wanted to be very prominent in this. So the next three bullets address this. We wanted to provide the data to drive the discussion uh, and solutions across the industry. Use the results we found and feedback to evolve sharing features, uh, shape policy, and even inform commercial models. And finally, we wanted to share throughout. Along the way, we are very much transparent in our researcher, uh, with our researcher, publisher, and library communities about the trial. So the starting statement was pretty simple. Um, scientists have always shared their work. And in fact, I just found, I uh, just was browsing my back issues in the New York Times, uh, end of February, Mark Scott had an article uh, called A Facebook-Style Shift in How Science is Shared. It's a quick article in case you guys want to look it up. But it's just, again, reiterating, scientists always share their work. It's their basic tenant. Our basic position as a publisher was also simple. We have a duty to facilitate the sharing. Um, so the, you know, this is, this is very simple, two statements that we built off of, but we had a couple of, of stumbling blocks or caveats to move through. The current tools for sharing are, are just simply not there. You have something like Dropbox um, for dumping information, or ICANN has PDF. If you guys aren't familiar with this hashtag, it's also worth a Google. It's a great case study and um, a great dialogue within the community. So it's a virtual black box for publishers and libraries in terms of usage and data. It's nothing we can really use when people are sharing outside of, of um, the normal sharing circles. And ultimately, it could create conflict. The last thing a publisher wants to do is issue a takedown notice. So again, if we can facilitate legal and easy sharing, we're going to do it. So the question is how. We were lucky enough to have uh, Digital Science as a partner in this. So you've got this wonderful nature content. We've got 49 uh, nature publishing group journals participating. We've got this amazing content from nature. We've got this incredibly dense technology from ReCube, one of our partners. 
that enables enhanced PDF technology to be read, but not easily kind of downloaded or printed, et cetera. It had limited functionalities as read-only. So it was, it was a perfect um, relationship between these two partners to come up with a very um, seemingly simple solution, but as yet it hadn't happened. So that's just kind of the, the architecture of the, the program itself and the, the technology behind it. So that brings us to, well, who is actually sharing? So we had two, two forms of sharing. You could do a peer-to-peer -peer share, which was a subscriber of one of those 49 nature journals, sharing to their colleagues or friends um, or, or departments because they have the access themselves. That shareable link, in turn, would allow access to someone else. Again, it's access in a shareable read-only full-text version. We then, on the second side of the, the slide, had the media referrals, and this one's very interesting. This would be somewhere like the BBC or the New York Times mentioning one of our articles, then linking out to, again, the shareable read-only full-text uh, article for the viewers and readers of that um, distilled media mention. So this, again, underscores one of our topics was easily share with the larger audience and larger um, uh, consumers, so to speak, of scientific literature. So try and remember these two character illustrations, both the peer-to-peer -peer and the media referral, because we're going to return to them um, in the rollout chapter. And maybe here I'll pause and say a note about what we mean by sharing. We've since evolved and developed some pretty um, robust sharing um, rules, I guess is the way to say it. But basically we just want to say reasonable and personal use. So this, you know, and we found that uh, people, people adhere to this. We evolved it a tiny bit because we've got, um, it's, an easy, it's such an easy way to share, even internally when we're doing marketing promotion, we wanted to kind of latch onto this technology and use it freely in our marketing campaigns. We kind of pared back on that and said it's, it's really for, for the peer-to-peer uh, -peer and media referrals. So, so moving on to, moving on to the uh, statistics about what happened in that year trial, so to speak, um, we had, over 800,000 shared views during this period, um, which was phenomenal. Again, these, these numbers were quite transparent. We shared all of the information uh, and wrote it up extensively in, in press releases throughout the closure of the year. But this is just a quick snapshot of kind of what we distilled down. And we found that most referrers did come from the media sites, so those, those uh, media sites that I mentioned, The Guardian, Science, The uh, Washington Post, BBC and New York Times were the top sharers. Those are the most prolific. Um, but of course, there were uh, uh, others as well. That means that 23% were peer-to-peer -peer shares. So again, subscribers who had access and then forwarded on or posted a shareable link to the content. This is kind of interesting. We always wanted to provide data to inform and further refine the constructive discussion around content sharing within the industry. So at the close of the trial, and I put close here in quotes because it never really closed, um, we updated um, our press releases to inform everyone that the, the on-platform sharing of the, the uh, nature.com articles using ReCube's technology would continue indefinitely. But before that, we did kind of stop and evaluate the trial. We saw steady usage, but modest numbers, and we asked ourselves, do we maybe need to promote a little bit better among the researchers? We saw the media channels using it, which was great, but what about those researchers? We didn't see any downturn in single article sales, which was a plus and one of the most often asked questions, obviously. We wanted to be commercially viable. We saw little to no instances of abuse, got tons of media attention, social media um, chatter. So in all, it was a generally positive um, experiment or trial. Maybe we could frame our uh, open access position a little bit stronger, and we wanted to be mindful of that. And of course, there's always, in any type of discussion like content sharing, there's going to be digital right management concerns. So that brings us to the rollout in 2016. And a new name, and again, coming from the marketing perspective, I think this is part of the, uh, one of the more interesting aspects of it, and in the spirit of full disclosure and lessons learned, I had a personal opinion about naming this, um, this offering. Content sharing is kind of what the industry has been using uh, as long as this has been discussed. We were framing our own expertise within the content sharing space, so I was a little unclear on why we needed to stop and, and kind of brand it. Turns out, um, it was the best thing we could have done. It took a little bit of time to kind of get our ducks in a row and uh, didn't put a, 
push us too far behind schedule. And we did have a schedule. We wanted to be first to market with this, and we were. Um, but naming it allowed us to track it and market, market it and hashtag it extensively. And I will say internally it was something and externally that we could really latch on to. So shared it has really become um, really part of our, our language, and it's wonderful to, to, to have that um, to brand it. So, again, well, I wasn't convinced in the beginning, but I'm a believer now. Um, so just very quickly, first half of 2016, we soft launched it and kind of let folks know it was coming, but by October we were fully integrated um, with all of our portfolio and made a full announcement. So I, I uh, mentioned that you should remember those little uh, kind of character uh, icons. Again, in the trial we had peer-to-peer -peer sharing, we had media referrals, but within this uh, rollout we also expanded not only the content coverage to all of our journals, but to uh, the functionality was expanded into our authorship, which for me, looking after our authors and keeping them happy with robust author services, this was, this was huge for me. Um, now we enable authors to share their content very easily, effortlessly, and as part of the publication workflow. So we, we often look to a, um, uh, a data point from Research Square, uh, another partner of ours that we uh, commissioned a study with, which found 37% of authors said they don't know how to communicate their results effectively to the general public and 47% said they had no control over the successful promotion of their research. To me, this is troubling and certainly something to constantly go back to and make sure that we can address in any service that we're providing to make sure that we help alleviate some of those uncertainties about how to present what good is your science if it can't be communicated. And science communication is such a hot topic these days, and certainly as information specialists uh, within institutions, you know that this is critical. So the author sharing aspect um, was a real win for us. And again, as part of the publication workflow, we simply alert the author upon publication that here's your shareable link and here's what you can do with it. And it's virtually anything. You can post to your internal sites, you can turn uh, to your um, social media sharing and your scientific social media sharing. So let's just take a quick look uh, as to what this actually looks like, uh, perhaps for you guys from an institutional standpoint, what it looks like on SpringerLink. So here we are in a um, one of my favorite journals, Estuaries and Coats. Um, and you'll see within any journal card article, you have some sharing options in the right-hand panel. And if you just click anywhere on that screen, not necessarily in the box, it should link. It should link uh, right out to um, the. <laughs> That's okay. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, it goes to the uh, experience on Recube. Um, and then you can see here all the functionality of Recube, exactly. Um, not being able to print it, but full text um, using Recube technology. So just to close out this chapter, we had some nice accolades from Outsell, and Outsell is a, a research and advisory firm that focuses on the intersection of information, media, technology, and data. Um, and they often do some wonderful reports um, they, they did a snapshot analysis of the year in review, and we made it into the headlines of, of the top 2016 and why it matters. And some of the, the key phrases that I love in the um, analyst write-up include the acknowledgement of our industry's um, largest companies still innovating. And, and I take a little offense to her next sentence with that does call us a big traditional publisher, um, but as long as she's acknowledging that we are certainly still able to innovate and innovate well um, in a very pragmatic way, I was happy. Um, and she does give a nice nod to the way we approached it. Again, a small trial, a year-long initiative, the results thoroughly demonstrated openness, assessed the results, and uh, as you saw at the end of 2016, a full rollout. So that leads us uh, to where we are now. So we've just closed a quarter. I can share a little bit of findings we do, and we will be press releasing this very shortly because, again, as the industry leaders here, we really want to make a big splash, and we're excited to do that. But I'm giving you a little sneak peek, not with concrete numbers, um, but you can see how the subscriber sharing views 
um, both columns, both the subscriber sharing views and the author sharing views, are showing wonderful development month on month, January, February to March, first quarter. But look at those author shares, uh, nearly three to one. Um, huge numbers of our authors are sharing their work, which for me is a win uh, instantly. As background, when we launched this initiative, we did go back and notify uh, about 400,000 authors saying, hey, this link in this service is now available to you uh, to use freely. And again, of course, going forward, authors, as they publish, are made aware of their shareable link. So one other quick snapshot of our current uh, 2017 uh, year-to-date findings are who's sharing and, and where they're coming from. So we see shares from over 200 ca uh, countries, uh, and the distribution, again, subscriber sharing on the left, author sharing on the right, are very similar views. So we didn't see anything um, so interesting there. But everyone who saw this graph commented on China, why China was so small, because in everything else we do, that's not the case. So that's something that we'll look into, certainly for marketing. Do I need to market differently uh, in my China market? Probably. Um, so we'll kind of dig deep into that going forward and see if we can um, make sure that it's more representative of what we think. Um, and if there's, it's still not in line with what we think, then we need to change our thinking and understand a little bit more about that audience. So those are just, uh, uh, again, two quick snapshots of where we stand. And then to close out, I wanted to widen the view a little bit and bring it into an industry-wide perspective um, from the larger STM industry. The STM Association actually sponsored a um, early consultation on article sharing that we were integral to. I'm very proud of the fact that we were um, one of the first to participate and shape the space and certainly the first to launch it. I will say that other publishers have launched content sharing in uh, different Different iterations and different size. We're certainly the largest to do this because we've got all of our content covered. Um, but everybody is, is kind of involved. And I think the final slide here kind of shows who's, um, yeah, who's supporting um, the content sharing initiative, which they branded, how can I share it? So that gives you a little quick view of, of the other publishers that might be involved. And of course, technology uh, folks are using ReadCube as well. So it's kind of, um, Everybody's, everybody's really trying to um, come together here because it's such an industry-specific industry and industry-interesting dialogue um, that we really can be powerful drivers to. So with that, I, I close out and, um, and thank you for listening. All right. Um, we're ready to move on to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Feel free to now submit any questions you may have um, in the Q&A box. Okay, um, now we're ready to get started on this. We have a question for Paul uh, with regard to recommended. Someone asked, um, they regularly delete their cookies. Will that be a problem with using recommended? So at the moment, unfortunately, yes, um, because we are based on just a single cookie. Um, we are doing some development work right now, which will allow um, us to track people across different devices, and so if you have um, different cookies, we can unify that, um, which will be a much more useful thing for you. All right, great. And um, also, um, for recommended, is there an email sign-up similar to setting up an alert? Um, in a way, um, I would think that the alerts are more kind of uh, when a new thing is published, we will send you an email. This is more of a regular schedule, um, so every week. Um, and you don't really kind of set which topics you're interested in. That's implicit in what we know that you've read. Um, it's the same kind of hopefully keeping you informed, um, but less effort on your part. Um, and as I said earlier, you can then also change the frequency uh, and the schedule of the email uh, that comes through. Great. And it's my understanding that we track papers across the broad spectrum of sciences and humanities. There's a question with regard to whether we track papers in business, economics, and education. So um, currently, we only track 
uh, reading across the Spring of Nature websites. Um, we will track anything with the DOI, uh, regardless of which discipline, which area it's in. Um, we'll only give recommendations, though, um, in more of the kind of the natural sciences. Um, I noticed in the Q&A uh, there's a comment about it, uh, Crossref doesn't really work very well for social sciences. Agreed. Um, we decided more that for the for the product for the moment, um, it's more about primary scientific literature. Um, if we feel that this will be a useful service wider, um, we we are happy to look into that. Um, and also, yes, the team is always happy to uh, talk about the service more. Um, we work with a third party. Um, who do more on the algorithm side. So obviously they um, have a bit more kind of, uh, they're not quite as open, um, but we're all happy to talk about it. So we may not be able to give the precise details, um, but yeah, any, any comments, feedback, uh, questions, happy to chat. All right, great, great. And um, we have a question for Shared It for Maureen. Are there other publishers participating in shared it. Yeah, I think we saw in that uh, closing slide the other participants of um, content sharing initiatives. Ours, of course, is the only branded shared it, I hope. Um, but I do know since that, uh, even since we announced our large-scale rollout, um, Wiley uh, came in February, I want to say, uh, with a limited edition of, um, a limited content of, um, of their content sharing initiative. And others, of course, have uh, solutions as well. Great. And another question for shared it. Are the um, shares counter compliant? Uh, that's a good question. I know we're looking into the distributed usage logging, um, which is part of the counter um, the counter groups from one of their subgroups. Uh, for those of you who obviously all of you found uh, follow and are closely relating um, to uh, counter compliant issues, but the distributed usage logging um, is capturing um, traditional usage, usage um, outside of our own Springlink, um, and this is obviously a growing trend because of things like content sharing um, or alternative metrics. So it is being looked at and will be uh, kind of framed within that soon enough. Okay, and an additional question: um, uh, Can these um, links be shared in um, in the classroom, in coursework, in, and in um, um, you know online courses? Yeah, well, we do say it's for personal non-commercial sharing, so certainly for, you know, conversations and that sort of thing, but it wouldn't take the place of, um, for instance, if we do roll it out to textbooks or something, it wouldn't roll it, uh, replace textbook adoptions in any sense, but it does help facilitate quick dialogue and uh, sharing peer-to-peer, -peer, or, as this case, authors um, can share their work with colleagues for personal use. Okay. Um, if there are any other questions, you can submit them um, in the Q&A box. Let's take a look here to see if anyone else has any other questions. And great. All right, well, thank everyone for all those great questions. It does look like we're ready to wrap up our time together today and Hope that you have gained some value from learning about these new complementary services from Springer Nature um, that are helping to provide academic libraries uh, in advancing research. I'll turn it back over to Mark now. Great. Thank you, Michael. This is Mark from uh, ACRL and Choice. I'd just like to say to, uh, thank you to all of our presenters today, to uh, Paul and Maureen, uh, for talking to us about um, these, these uh, sharing services. I think that's a, a really exciting uh, development in um, publishing uh, in general, just to be able to, to get the stuff out there to um, really anybody who might have an interest in it. Um, I'd like to say uh, thanks again for sharing all of your insights on this with us today. I'd also like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program. So be on, a lookout, uh, be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL in Choice with a link to that recording. Thanks to everybody who is out there listening in today. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the session and that the rest of your day is great. <laughs>